Okay, how you doing? So, last time we met was in Greenwich, London. Yeah. And we were talking about uh, Miyamoto Masashi's Book of Five Rings. Yep. So now we're in Jakarta, and you can hear the toot toot of Jakarta rush hour so traffic. The famous Jakarta traffic. Yeah. It's absolutely absurd. Yeah. Ridiculous, ludicrous, insane, dumb, just not good. Like swarms of ants. <laughs> like these little scooters going, Dah, Dah, like just swarming through traffic. It's crazy. So, we're going to take the Book of Five Rings into a bit more detail. And we're going to take the first book, which is Earth. Earth. Okay. So, since we uh, were in London and we gave you an overview of the Book of Five Rings, Miyamoto Masashi, who he was, just to recap, he was probably the most famous swordsman in all of Japan. He developed the unique two sword fighting style, uh, which we practice called Niten, which is basically like a kind of two sword thing. So, it's a long sword and a. It's like a shorter sword. And the short sword, what's the difference between the long sword and the short sword? Well, samurais would normally carry two swords. Okay. Uh, you have your normal uh, katana, and then you have like a wakasashi, sometimes a tanto or dagger. Uh, so the way of doing it is that you, you basically draw these swords, and you have one that's long, one that's short, and you learn a defense. If I had my swords, I'd show you, right? <laughs> but, but pretty much, there are different techniques because one is long and one is short, so you're holding them like this, wow. so that the points come at an apex, or there's different styles like this, and anyway. So, so this like, guy's not actually a swordsman, so that's why he knows this. But the short sword, is this correct? Because I'm just taking from the idea of combat. Yeah. Would you say that the shorter sword is used for like close quarters? Generally, yeah. Okay. <coughs> do you use one sword, two swords? So do you ever use like a big sword with two hands? Because I, I read that it's for like when you're trying to strike. Normally, I can't know, the Japanese sword is a two-handed sword, right? Okay. That's why when you see fencing or anything like that, it's two but hands. But Masashi didn't like the two hands. Uh, we'll come on to that later. Okay. Right? okay. But he, he developed his own style. But yeah. generally speaking, you held a sword with two hands in Japanese swordsmanship. Yeah. Um, you were saying something else. What was the thing you said before? I said just close quarters, like the short sword. Right. Yeah, close quarters. Normally, the way that I learned martial arts is, is like this: the weapon size dictates the proximity of your opponent. Right. So, kind of, in, in, if you're a samurai, the longest weapon you have is the spear. Right. right? Yeah. And you do that when someone is far away. Yeah. When they're a bit closer, then it's a sword. Even closer, wakizashi, uh, shorter sword, and then even closer, a dagger, and right. then hands. Right. There's no point in running after somebody with a dagger, yeah. right? True. When they're at spear's distance. So there's a lot of it to do with proximity. And also, the same with actually uh, fighting styles, right? Yeah. Like uh, when I did Wing Chun Kung Fu, you use your hands um, when you're close to somebody, right? Okay. Hands, you might as well use your hand if you're going to hit someone in the face. Yeah. Some martial arts, like Taekwondo, you're going to kick somebody in the face. Uh, Wing Chun, hand is closest, head is closest, right? You don't kick above the waist. So, similarly, your leg is, long, is longer than your arm, so you kick when somebody's further away. Yeah. Hands, like, you know, when they're closer. Anyway. So, Masashi's Book of Five Rings, he was Japanese greatest swordsman. He developed a two sword style. I think you need to recap like what, how he started his book, because okay. that is just amazing. He started his book by saying he's basically over the age of 60, and he killed over 60 men in duels. So one of the things that would, would happen at that time was that someone would challenge you to a duel. Yeah. Who knows what the reason could be, right? Maybe yeah. they didn't like the way you looked at them. I'm sorry, I'm looking off to because I'm, I'm amazed by the Jakarta traffic. I'm listening to him, but I'm just <laughs> amazed. And just the uh, what's going on. I, I'll probably show you guys what's going on over there. Some Focus on the blog. But I'm, mis I'm, I'm missing. I'm completely, it's just like I'm literally mesmerized by so what's going on. He killed over 60 men in okay. duels. You would challenge somebody to a duel, and then it'd be like, same as like in, in England or wherever, meet me at this place at dawn yeah. or at this time, and then you both arrive, yeah. come, sword, and then it's like, you know, Japanese duels are, are normally very short. And basically, like someone dies. Yeah, kill or be killed, maybe wounded, but they probably die from the wounds. You know and what? What's funny about fighting? Okay. Right. And this kind of fighting, everything uses fighting as the analogy. Fighting yeah. is the analogy. Yeah. Whether you're talking business, 
sports, they're always likening it to fighting. Yeah. Fighting, you don't ever liken it to like any other thing because it's so, what's the word, death? It's so final, right? Yeah. Death is like the finality of it all. So there, in, in business, like we're talking about, you can't bounce back, <coughs> get another round of funding, pick up a new CEO. Yeah. It's the end. And that's what's really interesting about doing the Book of Five Rings, especially Musashi. Well, because for the Japanese, fighting wasn't a pastime. Right? It was life and death. True. Like, it wasn't like kind of watching Anthony Joshua, <laughs> 70,000 people in an arena. It was literally like, I'm going to turn up and today I will die. Yeah. Or somebody else will die. And that's what Musashi talks about. Right. The power is in realizing that you're prepared to die. When you accept that, then you go into every duel, like, without, like, I guess the butterflies. Because I, I guess you. I don't know. I would have to ask Musashi or someone that is. Do you have butterflies after your twentieth murder? Like, do you still get that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I well, can't. I, I'm, saying, I'm talking like the only thing I've heard oh, uh, uh, is so. chicken. I said I have to pick up this T-shirt. This is a ramen T-shirt from Washington D.C. Right. I thought like he said. Yeah, after killing twenty people, yeah, I don't have any butterflies anymore. After I kill the chicken, or I'll just kill about twenty chicken wings in one sitting. Um, no, I, I don't think the butterflies go away. Yeah, I don't think so. Either. But I think they. I think it just becomes more knee jerk and just easier to do. No, because you know what? If it's something which unsettles you, they come back. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the Earth is about is about grounding people. And the analogy of, of being Earth is important, but yeah. in a strategy, yeah. so that nothing is of a surprise to you, yeah. right? So, fighters can be put off by anything, right? If you, if you take a modern day scenario, like a boxer, or someone has a bad day, what, what could cause a bad day, right? All well, kinds of things. We're in Jakarta. Could, could <laughs> this, be, this traffic that I'm looking right. at can cause a bad day. Diarrhea, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, you could have the runs. I'm trying, right? I'm trying to avoid every... Dairy product, uncooked meal. No disrespect to the Indonesians, but I've had some interesting stories and a lot of people. You could be hungry. You could have had like a bereavement. There could be any number of things. You could have had a fight with your child, your spouse, right. your boyfriend. That, you know, you could have a paper cut, right? Yeah. But anything that takes you away and distracts you, I think that that never goes away. It's how you manage that. Because if you put business in the mix, right? And people were to assume that when you get to the age of 40, 50, mm. 60, that basically, oh, you don't have nerves anymore, or you know everything that's to come. Yeah. Well, there's always something that's going to unsettle you, right? Because maybe there's a pattern that doesn't follow. I mean, for example, you as a guy, right? As a guy. Right? <laughs> as a, as this a American, yeah. Asian in a black man's body, or as a black man <laughs> in an Asian's body, or whatever it is, right? I don't know what no, but, is. but you unsettle people because they assume that you're going to be, what, good at maths? <laughs> or like, you know, American isn't your native tongue, or like, yeah. they're going to assume that I'm a rapper, or like, you know, or I don't know, I'm some sort of thug or something. But, but I think that, you know, upon reflection, I can't blame people for being unsettled, because maybe they've never come across people like you. But, right? Yeah, not true. So, whatever experience they've had, I think the important thing is that you have to have many experiences so that you're consistently being recalibrated so that things aren't surprising to me. There's so many ways I can go with this. Right? Yeah, go on. Being able to adapt, yeah. which I think is a trait specific to human beings than yeah. other species. You said a word that really got me going was when you said managing, yeah. right? And being able to manage. We, you know, we talk a lot about business and managing. You may not ever solve an issue with fill in the blank, your boss. Boss. Here we go. Uh, come this way. Oh, we got it. We got we we got the most. We got uh, drinks. <laughs> come, come this way. Come over here. Come over here. Uh, are you sure? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, on, come on. Come on. Are you sure? You're the one that said, "Oh, can I?" <laughs> she was like, "Oh, can I be in it?" But right, this one is lemon grass, and this is the tea. This is called like jam, cranberry juice, and tea. No, Just right. Demi kasi. Demi kasi. Oh man. I like, I said, if you got like fruit and cherries and umbrellas and stuff, look, sorry, I have to like. 
Mine got like a little. The pros gonna pull out. There's like jam, jam. on top of <laughs> my uh, calamansi. Yeah. Or limao, limao. So he, he said, if I do this for you, I'm gonna get a shout in your vlog. I was like, okay, so he's gonna come afterwards, right? Okay, he's gonna come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the guy wearing the fedora? <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, go, anyway, go. so we're, we're talking about managing. Sorry. No, managing. I was talking about management. Oh, certain things you won't be able to solve. And I think with management, right? World hunger. I don't know if that'll ever be solved. Why? There's just too many moving pieces. Governments, I don't know why I'm getting really, really broad with this, but when you said management, I the first thing I thought is just certain things you just, men in sports, yeah. every world-class athlete is not 100%. Correct. They're managing some ailment. The reason why you can say, oh yeah, he's coming back for his game and he's 100%. Nah, because after the game, he's icing himself for like the next three hours. Yeah. He's waking up, he's taking painkillers. He's t because that's what war, battle, fighting. So what was that thing like, when we were talking last night? So said? managing, you gotta be able to, like world-class athletes, they just have to be able to manage pain. So you said there were two things, managing pain. And adaptability. And but that, but and we can get it. In sport, you said the best athletes, and you played American football, right? Oh, yeah. I yeah. played rugby. So you said being able to play through pain yeah. and recovering from pain. Yeah, that's, yeah. And that was the pain management, right? So yeah. playing injured and recovering. And that's what makes the greats. People don't yeah. really take that into account, but the reason why certain athletes become great is management of pain. And yeah. Because they're all in pain. Yeah. And it's all about recovery, but you're never 100%. Like once you break your knee for the fourth time, like it's not gonna be the same. Like True. once you hurt, I mean that's pretty extreme, but it's just not gonna ever be the same, especially if you break it again. Yeah. I mean, you, it's just so many, I don't wanna get into naming certain athletes, but you know your favorite athlete who was supposed to be the next big thing, who got hurt, never came back. Okay, so anyway, go ahead. So I'm taking it, we're going back. Oh, wait, take a drink. <laughs> oh, <laughs> keep talking, keep talking. Right, meanwhile. So, in the Book of Earth, and, and the books are in order. Do you remember the order? It's not Earth, Wind, and Fire. Remember? That? That's all I remember. That's all I remember is Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> it's actually nice. Yeah. It was Earth. What does this taste like? What else was there? Earth, fire, wind, nothingness. Earth, water, water. Fire, wind, nothingness. Right. Yeah. I think so. Anyway. <laughs> if it's wrong, there'll be a subtitle. <laughs> Earth is the strategy chapter. Right? That lays the foundations. And that pretty much starts with this notion of nobody's invincible, so there is no point in studying the art of invincibility. You know, I said interesting. I, I knew yeah. it was about strategy. The reason why it, never, it, it dawned on me is that in order to be a good strategist, yeah. You have to think about everything Musashi says is in great scale, large scale. You can't be a great strategist unless you think of everything in mass scale. So it's very interesting that he starts with this, right? Because yeah. he's a fighter to the death. And it's all about strategy. And I think, and he ends with like timing. Yeah. The importance of timing. But let me not steal the thunder. I'm just going to go in and throw some jabs wherever you talk. Go ahead. Take the points off. Yeah. Timing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's all right. Someone move your car. Stuck in the car. It's all right. Go ahead. Okay. But I want to stick on timing for a minute because you Dude, we could talk about timing for so long. So that's why I wanted you to continue okay. with, and then we can end with timing. <laughs> right. So um, invincibility. No one is invincible and studying all sorts of things, right? Yeah. He basically was talking about having a broad-based education, but being a nerd about it, right? Not just like, learn everything, but like, learn everything in detail and understand the relevance of those aspects of detail, right? So, so that you're not surprised, right? Because yeah, he talks about, you know, you're not, you know, no one's invincible. It's not about who's better than other. That's what he said. It's not about, if you're better than the other person, it's all about winning. Yeah. 
right? And then it's also, what did he say? He had another part where it's, and knowing the difference between profit and profitability. Yes. That's what he was saying, that yeah, yeah. there's no reason to compare yourself to another person and knowing who's better. Just like knowing the difference between profit and profitability. Yes, because he always, what he's basically saying, let's focus on you. It's yeah. all about you. And how you gauge the situation, your understanding, because one thing he always talks about, and you'll come to see this in the book, he always talks about there is no replacement for practice, practice, practice. It's all about training. Yeah. And the reason why you become good and you have this intuitive judgment is because you're, you've seen so much. You've been able to, you know, process so much information and you have this, and he talks about because of this, you're able to make not just good judgments, the key word for me that I, when I read this was, you're able to make quick decisions. Okay. I want to come back to practice, right? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I remember that, I'm like... I'm completely stealing, like, you're supposed to go... No, 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 no. no. It's all okay. good. <laughs> because when I think about practice, when I, when I first started martial arts, there's this duality that actually, as a beginner, they seem like a paradox, right? Yeah. Because you read all of these martial arts books, and Masashi is one of those people where he was a calligrapher, yeah. right? And he was an artist, he painted pictures, he did calligraphy, you know, he would meditate. And so you find about these Renaissance type figures who, and samurai would do, like, do geography and maths and art and poetry. He talks about business. Yeah, all those things, Music. right? He says, have a broad based education. And then on the other side, he basically says, um, practice the art of swordsmanship. Yeah. Right? So I remember like oh, one of my senses, like when I said, could you give me some tips how to get better at kendo, which is Japanese fencing, um, how to get better, what could I do? And he said, the best uh, way to get better at kendo is to do kendo. <laughs> and I went to, so does that mean So it's like, not working out. So you see other is athletes, that right? that, No, no. Doing kendo, practicing kendo, putting on the uniform, picking up the shinai, the bamboo sword, and just doing kendo putting in those hours. Now, that seems to be contradictory because it's like, well, one minute I'm a calligrapher and I'm yeah. an artist and I'm doing poetry. The next one you're saying, just like, basically, take your, your bamboo sword apart, polish it, put it back together again, practice, hit a tree trunk a thousand times, all that kind of stuff. But that is what more recently people call what? A T-shaped yeah. type of knowledge, right? Yeah. You become a T-shaped expert. This kind of covering a broad base of education and deep diving into particular things. But see, what's interesting about what Musashi says is that when you know the way broadly, when he yeah. talks about it, we'll go into this. When you know one thing, you know 10,000 things. And I think he's talking about principles there, right? When you know one certain principle, do not be dishonest. You can put yourself into so many different situations where you stick to that principle. Yeah. Practice. You can take that into business, you can take that into sports, you can take that into chess. Anything that you do, whether you're a carpenter, it's all about putting in the work. But I also think it's the depth that's important, right? Because if you learn... But when you talk about broad based you don't have to... Like, you can't get deep into carpentry. Okay, but let me give you an example. Okay. If you learn to play the guitar... Okay. In theory, it's easier, or it should be easier to then learn how to play uh, the bass guitar. Even the violin, perhaps, because it's a string instrument, or even maybe the piano because it's, it's notes. But if you don't have enough experience, it's still difficult because you haven't mastered the guitar. One of the things I've noticed is people that are really good musicians, as in they, they've developed uh, this area of mastery, they can go into other instruments, yeah, true. and those skills are transferable. But you have to meet, I mean, we spoke about the whole 10,000 hour rule and everything. Yeah. I think there's some similarity there. It's like, once you've got your head above water and you're comfortable yeah. in that particular art, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the guitar, then you can reach for another instrument and it shouldn't cause you as many problems. It should, it should be familiar to you, right? Yeah. Familiar enough that you're not gonna like, kind of make a fool of yourself. And I think that's the same with martial arts. Once you get to a certain threshold of like, you know, you're a black belt or something, 
then if you did like taekwondo from karate then that's fair enough business I would say it's the same thing if you actually mastered um, food you could go into drink eating yeah, yeah, yeah. Or cooking chicken <laughs> what you don't know chicken y'all can go to beef lamb <laughs> shrimp but, but I want to I want to throw in this one thing because he talks about how people shouldn't have he said you shouldn't have a favorite weapon yeah this was very interesting to me he said you shouldn't have a favorite weapon having a favorite weapon and he specifically says like favorite being, weapon being over familiar when you're over familiar with your weapon he says it's as equivalent to not knowing your weapon sufficiently do you reckon i could kill you with a piece of lemongrass that's the thing about what musashi talks about right in your is, that, hole, is, that, is that you should be able to kill with anything and everything whether it's you know a piece of lemongrass whether it's a rattan seat whether it's a knife whether it's a phone he said that's knowing the way broadly and so when you talk about knowing everything and having this broad shape, once you know, once you've taken the way, and I say this, which he says in another way, but I say that when you really pay close attention to life, everything can teach you. Yeah. And he says the same kind of thing, but anyway, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, you're right, because if you, like, you know, some people have, I don't know, their lucky pair of socks if you're a footballer. Yeah. You lose your lucky pair of socks, where'd you go? No, the best one was um, Pulp Fiction. Remember Pulp Fiction? Where <laughs> by Bruce Willis, right? The whole thing with Christopher walking in the watch. Remember the kid? This watch. <laughs> the watch, right? That he's done. <laughs> and he gave it to Walker yeah, yeah. and he stored it. Yeah, yeah. But Bruce Willis, the sentimental value. Well, he stored it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Go the ahead. sentimental value of that watch was immense. Yeah. So immense that he was going to put his, basically his life online yeah. to get it back. Right? Yeah. Now, some footballers have lucky socks. Some people like can only use a certain type of computer True. or pen True. or like, you know, and if you can't then adapt, then there are problems, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you're, if your business model can only function in one way, you're used to retail. Yeah. And everybody's going online. Yeah. Right? So we think. Not, not retail, but you're saying like brick and mortar. Yeah, if you're not recently. So there are a lot of high street stores in London that are like their sales are down for Christmas, uh, yeah. they're closing shops. Amazon, I don't know, it's Rub Salt and Wounds or something, is like going. They opened a pop up shop uh, on Black Friday in London. How'd they do? I don't know. <laughs> I was marking assignments. I, I, was fucking I feel that they're gonna get broken up soon because of monopoly yeah. reasons. I just feel that they're just. I mean, Bill Gates. But got, Amazon is a very good example. But Microsoft that. got broken up. But that so that breadth, right? right? If you look at Amazon, books. They started with books, yeah. Then they got CDs. Then they got everything. Like, now it's, it's like, like everything. Yeah. Deliver food because they they developed expertise in fulfillment of a particular logistics. Thing. That was yeah. It. Just and, then, and that became, it wasn't just we sell books, but they, they gathered data. Yeah. All data was relevant, right? Yeah. Which then meant that they would also be able to recommend seemingly unconnected objects to people who found them relevant, right? Yeah. And the more relevant they were, the more that they liked them, the better the data got, they purified the data sources. Yeah. And now they can deliver like food within an hour in certain cities. Right? Yeah. So I think that they're a good example of that application of strategy. They, they learn the terrain, yeah. right? Whether that's the virtual world or the physical world, they learn the terrain and they look for patterns, behavioral practices. Masashi is all about that, right? So you, there was one that you were talking about, um, about the carpenter. Yeah, and tools talks about, yeah. And wood. So he was talking about different types of wood being useful, but like some people might say, oh, like, you know, Willow is good for a cricket bat, right? Or pine is good for a chest of drawers, or yeah. mahogany is good. So Bobinga is good for a basic guitar. But he's, he spoke about the grain of wood yeah, and the aesthetics, right? The grain, the aesthetics, and the strength. Okay. So what's interesting and in how I brought this into business when he was looking at the master carpenter, and it's like he said, once you know, you know, once you can, you have the weight, you can see it in everything. Right, you can, he's like, don't do anything that's of no use. Basically, when you 
experience life. You can look at this traffic and take so many different lessons from it. That's what he's trying to say is that if you are of the way, everything that you come across, you can take a lesson from. So when he was talking about master carpentry, I don't know him to be a carpenter, but he knew, like, in regard to wood, he was saying that if you are building a house or a temple, that if the wood is strong but ugly, then it should be like the foundation. If the wood is weak or not as strong and has a lot of defects, you should use it for firewood. If it's beautiful and strong, then it should be used for windows. If it's beautiful and has really exceptional grain, then it should be for like rebuilt pillars. If it's strong but has a lot of defects, and I mean looks ugly, then it should be like inner pillars. And basically, what he, what joke do you want to say? I see it on your face. <laughs> so, do you think coaches, like in American football or football or something, do you think they pick players? Like, no, absolutely. Do you, think, so. do you think ugly players always become defenders? <laughs> like, you, uh, like ugly face players? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> like good-looking guys always become strikers. Like, they yeah. might be like become the. They might become the face of the team, right? Are they good-looking? Like, what, what do you have on the line of scrimmage? Do you have like. O linemen and D linemen, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're they're like the hogs we call them, like the big dudes of the line. But in business or in sports, looking at how Musashi is talking about carpentry, it's very interesting because in sports, what he's saying is that you've got to recognize, or in business, you have to recognize what you have. So if you're the CEO of your company, you founded the company and you're leading the company, you gotta know the strengths and capabilities of your employees. Yeah. What they're good at. One's good at speaking, one's good at math, one's good at you know, uh, understanding customers. One has experience doing X, one does Y. Sports, yeah. American football, if you can talk about that, for example. Yeah. So I was gonna say, because like, because you, you brought it up. So I started right. to think that in, in sports, Previously, I used to think that you have a position and that makes you unique, right? But I've started to look at, like, even with, when, in my own career, it's like, are there complementary positions where you need to? So, in rugby, I play, um, like, either seven or eight, open side flanker or number eight. You won't know that, right? Oh, yeah. So, they're, they're in the scrum. All I know is all blacks. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> the complementary position for, a, I would say, for an open side flanker would be an inside center who's one of the backs, right? Mm. You won't know that. Yeah, so I I will know, know for those know. of you that play rugby and know rugby, you'll know. Open side. So I, I tried inside centre, but really I was trying open side, right? If I had to go to the back side of the But that's one. because you had a specific trait. Not even that. It's, it, yeah, so if we look at But it's also contextual. Yeah. Because if your team is stacked with a particular position and you have the skill that they may not have, like for example. Yeah. Like in offense and defense in American football, offense is you're trying to find the gap. Defense, you're trying to fill the gap. Yeah. Some, you need to be able to catch really well. And the other people that don't like play defense, we call them like butterfingers, we call them brick hands, because they can't catch anything. See, but that's, that's, not, their, that's rugby, not their job. I mean, that's the thing, like, American football is a good example because American football is like, is super extreme. Because in rugby, everybody has to catch. Yeah. Everybody has to tackle. But there are different, I can imagine yeah. that there are different. But, so for like, for, name, name two positions where you have to be exceptional in this. For example, in American football, a punter, he just kicks. I know. Like you don't have to, like a linebacker doesn't really need to know how to kick. So, yeah. so I mean, okay, <coughs> that's fine American football. So, and I think it's important here is context. Linebackers and tight ends, we have this chat, right? Okay. I think physically, they're quite similar. So if you don't play American football, a tight end is someone who is on the offense, yeah. offense, right? And he can run with the ball, or he can catch a throw, right? He's typically catching passes, yeah. Yeah, but, but sure. But he can block too. He can block. Because he's big. He can run with the ball, but not, a running back is the main runner, right? Running back is the main runner. But tight ends will take like, sh they might take short passes. They're just big guys. So they, they, so, take, so they take a they short can pass. Double, they can double. And they, they, Go in, right? They can block, okay, and then they can go out for a pass. That's okay. typically what tight ends do. And linebackers, all they're doing is tackling, right? So if physically you're saying that they're somewhat similar, which they could be. Now that I think about it, I think it. they're similar because 
body size, like if you watch television, but also yeah. the ability to do a bit of blocking yeah. and to move, yeah. to have reflexes where like, you know, where's the play going, yeah. I'm going to go there, I've got to either follow somebody or I've got to lose being following, but I think the, the difference is, okay, linebackers tackle yeah. and tight ends catch, but, and in terms of the spatial awareness, Linebackers have to basically make space feel narrow. Yeah, they fill gaps. And tight ends have to make Are space looking for feel gaps. wide. Yeah. Right? They have to make the, 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 the plane seem wider so that they can then kind of open things up. So essentially both of them are dealing with space yeah. and time. Yeah. yeah. They're both dynamic. And they're both trying to quick disrupt. Agile. Yeah. Right. But one is tackling. And the other one is basically catching, like, catching, and running through. Yeah, right. Because so, like a tight end would have like, as we say, like uh, top end speed, or yeah. uh, you know, meaning that he can go faster for longer. Yeah. Certain people only have bursts yeah, of yeah, speeds. Yeah. So that's what you have. That's why a linebacker he'll gas out if he's yeah. having to chase someone. You'll see him falling when, like, a, for example, a, a wide receiver catches it. You can see that he just he starts gaining. Yeah. He starts gaining, he just creates so much space. Anyway, we're going too deep into sports. No, I mean, got so rugby, um, yeah, there are certain technical things. So, like, certain players like a scrum half or the fly half, yeah. the fullback, are the main kickers. Yeah. Right? And generally speaking, like, you won't see a forward, the guys in the scrum, yeah. kick. And probably, if they did kick, they'd get in trouble. Like, I remember getting in trouble kicking once or twice. Yeah. They're like, it's just not what you do, right? It's, it's not considered. But every now and again, when I have kicked, it's worked really well. So that's where you're sort of tying it back yeah. to Musashi. This is where having to know the way broadly. Like when yeah. this, what do you get broad, what did you say, broad education? Or? Yeah, yeah. Like the whole broad and narrow thing. So in my position. People who are good, you say, in sports or in, uh, in music, yeah. they can play other instruments. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they, they developed this kind of It was not expected. Like, if I kicked, I'd get in trouble for my coach. Yeah. Like, but every now and again, I did a kick, and it was a good kick. And, it, and, and there was one time where it, kind of, it won us the match, right? I kicked in space. Yeah. And the reason that it worked was because it didn't expect me to kick. Because my position, number one, you don't. So, surprise. Yeah. You don't kick, so, and you're probably not good at kicking. But what they didn't know was, like every Sunday, because my, my dad used to play rugby, right? And he was he was a he was a back. Every Sunday, I'd be kicking the ball with my dad. Yeah. Every for like my entire career, I mean, because it was like one day yeah. I'm gonna have to kick. Yeah. And I don't want to mess it up, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so maybe proportionally, the amount of hours that I put into kicking compared to but other you you had some understanding of it. Right, because I just thought I have to be a complete player. And this is and this is what Musashi right. talks about. Yeah. Right? And then also the concept I want to touch on is he talks about don't copy others. Yeah. Right. And you see this a lot now in social media. And I I'm a high I you know I highly suggest people to create their own lanes. Right? Don't copy others. And he actually talks about Musashi. He said that how did he how did he label it? Don't use weapons that other people use. Use weapons that you can handle properly. So his key thing is like someone uses a gun. Don't you don't have to know or become really acquainted with a gun. Understand how it works. But if that's not what you're good at, just understand it, but don't copy because everyone now it's the new fan like the new thing to do, the new fangled idea, oh I'm gonna go do X, Y, and Z. If you're not good at it and you can't handle it correctly, don't do it. So I got two points of okay. questions. The first one is, like the martial arts I chose, or that I, I started to practice seriously, were the ones that I felt suited me, my physical ability, all those sorts of things, right? Like the size I am, it's not much fun kicking in the head. Yeah. I can do it, but like I remember one coach saying, "Your power is taking someone to the ground, or your center of gravity is like here, right?" Yeah. Uh, so the side of you putting your foot up on someone's head is like. Is not using your strengths, right? Yeah. But it was the ego thing. Was like, look, I want to be able to kick. You, know, you see a Bruce Lee movie like mine. I want to kick at someone's head, but I don't kick at people's head anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, knowing your strengths. Yeah. But at the same time, a coach would say that, but they want you to get on the program 
and basically learn the art of the way, even when it feels unfamiliar. Right? So I remember, like, a good example of martial arts is I used to, uh, uh, there was a certain move that we do in, in fencing where it's always going to rub the sole of your foot. Like, you're going to get blisters, it's going to hurt. And so a lot of people would start to wear strapping. Mm -hmm. You start to strap up your ankle no, or your foot. No, no, no. And uh, yeah, well, my sensei was like, why do you strap up your yeah, foot? And no. it's like, I already know. And I don't know, but I know where your sensei is. So he goes, goes like, I said I used to get blisters. He's like, well, have you ever asked your foot why you get blisters? And have you ever thought about doing it in such a way that you don't get blisters? I was like, okay. So then he's like, I don't need to use strapping. Now, that would mean that in martial arts, we didn't use strapping. You learned, like, but this is being accustomed, right? I okay. want to tie this all into but business, right? right? Because, because that, that Which is, I feel like we're talking about sports way too much. And then I know people are probably watching like, <laughs> they like sports. Right? Uh, With our record, but it's the duality. 22 views. <laughs> because, of, yeah, because on one level, right, you say, don't use your feet like that to avoid blisters. But on the other level, you have to do something which toughens up the soles yeah. of your feet so that so that it doesn't hurt. Like yeah. it's, it's it's not just one area where someone is like, oh, it's you know, you could have soft feet, right? So yeah. you have to be able to find a way to toughen yourself up. And that was the challenge for punching as well. Can you punch? And, and toughen your hands without cutting them because when they cut you've got to stop so that they heal so it's always knowing when to stop punching just enough that, that, that you're developing the, the, the kind of calluses but not so much that you're ripping your hands to pieces and, because they serve no purpose okay so <coughs> everything he talks about right he ties it very interesting that you talked about so two things i take from there I, the way that i was going to go with what his sensei was saying is that you have to become accustomed to the situation. Yeah. Right? You, in, in, in sports, right, in Muay Thai, you just have to develop callus, right? You have to yeah. develop, like, your body will become accustomed to the motion or movement, but most importantly, before that callus comes, you have to learn correct technique. Yeah. Right? And so, for me, okay, he ends the chapter, like, he focuses on timing. Yeah. Right? And what's really deep for me is when Musashi talks about timing, he, he talks about it in a sense that it must have rhythm. You must know background timing, you must know surprise timing, you must know fast timing and, and short timing, like fast timing and slow timing of everything. Everything he says is about timing, which he says in the five wings, you will come to see, it's all about timing. But one thing that really stood rhythm out to me- Rhythm and timing. Yeah, rhythm and time. But what stood out to me with the rhythm and timing was two things. Number one, he emphasized relevant timing. Okay. And that, I guess, talks about wisdom, being wise. Yeah. Right? Is that you must know why, no, you must know when to do X okay. and Y and Z because doing it at the wrong time will lead to your own defeat or your own failure. And then rhythm. He talks about, which is very interesting because it shows his, like, his, his, uh, his uh, spectrum, he talks about music, right? And he says the beauty of dancing and music is that with instruments, if the timing is incorrect, it sounds terrible. It's all about rhythm, yeah. right? The guitars, he goes, the, the instruments need to play at the correct end, that need to have the correct timing. If not, it's a complete disarray. Talking about sports, if people are not at the right place at the right time when they're supposed to be. When I throw the ball, you're supposed to be there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even looking where you're at. I'm just gonna throw it in five seconds. You need to find your way there. So I just wanted to touch on that because that's how he ends the chapter. It's his focus on timing and being able to adapt. So I wanna explain that as well because, okay. just quickly, because a lot of his work is, is looking at the, kind of the improvement itself, right? Yeah. But then going back to sport, sorry guys, but some of the best teams can throw passes or can kick passes unsighted yeah. because they just know that he's going to be in that space. Uh, uh, uh. So whatever he's doing to disrupt the defender, he will go into that space because we've done that. I don't need to worry about like which way he's, he's facing. It's like, I will throw into that space and he will make that space, yeah. right? Yeah. And that comes from constant practice. Yeah. So the thing that I want—that's another thing he brings up. Yeah. There's just we talked about. There's no replacement for practice. Right. You just got to keep. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I think I want to bring that, that back to work and basically say that like 
you know, if work with people and learn their timing, yeah? What and do you mean by that, learn their timing? Well, when they function, when, what's a good time? Like, people that work There's with that t-shirt, right? It's like, that's great, but let me get some coffee. There's a t-shirt I saw that's like, that's, that's great, but let me get my first cup of coffee. Like, yeah. they don't even want to hear you. Right. So learn their patterns. Like, the classic one I remember is, like, uh, when I first started, your boss. What time do they come to work? I decided, like, like in my first. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. In my my yeah. first job, it was like you start working at nine thirty. That's what the contract said. I knew that my boss would come in at eight thirty, <laughs> right? So I started coming in at eight thirty, and then I I thought because I thought I want to become a manager, so I should behave like a manager. Uh. And then actually, I came in at eight fifteen, and he was like, the first time I was like, what the hell are you doing? Are you like yeah. making phone calls to like I don't know somewhere else? Yeah. I was like, no, no, no. I just want to, and, and I said, I just want to come in so that I'm ready for the day. How am I going to get promoted if I can be a manager if I don't behave like a manager? And he was like, okay. And we had like an hour of unrivaled time because everyone else came in at 9.30 and I'd watch them come in, or 9.35 or 9.40 because the tubes are delayed. But I behaved like a manager. Yeah. And I got an hour with him, his undivided attention. Yeah. Wait, if you're watching then you know this, right? <laughs> um, and I got promoted. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it was to do with that, that mentality. Now, if you think about your work colleagues then, get to understand their patterns, what time they, they can reply to emails, how they work. I was gonna say something about emails. You know the yeah. old school trick when you were young is that like, there's probably apps for it, because I don't do it, but I imagine you can set when yeah, these yeah, emails yeah. are to be sent. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. remember, I remember back in the days, when people would be like, man, don't you ever see it? Emails are being sent at 2.30. And then my, I remember the, the girl said, like to a colleague, she said, oh, I just like get them all prepared and I wake up in the middle of the night and just press send oh, on all of them. But now you can check, right? Because like, uh, <laughs> That's funny, man. My, my current current CEO, Amanda, how you doing, Amanda? But um, <laughs> I noticed that she did a, she commented on LinkedIn at 3 a.m. Yeah. And, and I, I said, like, you commented at 3 a.m. And, and she replied back, so I knew that it wasn't a robot, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She actually was awake. So it was kind of like, you know, I don't know if I got brownie books. But the point I want to make is, yeah. The equivalent in sport of throwing an unsighted pass is that you trust your colleagues to do things, right? You don't have to ask their permission, go through protocol. It's like, I know what your skills are, I know that you'd be good for this, and I'm just going to put you forward. Yeah. I'm going to put you in. Because then you can squash time and control time. Yeah. Now, one of my bosses used to say, don't ask, ask for permission, pray for forgiveness. Yeah. I think that ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. He said pray. Oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's not even, that's not even, you're not even asking your boss, you're like, no, sorry, God. Um, but if you can work with your colleagues in a way that you develop a sense of, this is the sport analogy, yeah. team spirit and trust that you're on the winning team, you're on a win together, you're in it together, that you can throw unsighted passes, you've got each other's back. Yeah. That's one of the biggest problems in businesses, right? That mm. when things go wrong, people look to who to blame, right? Yeah. Who's going to get fired? Who's going to get dropped? Was it my fault? You cover your back. Yeah. In sport, why is such a great source of kind of inspiration? You do not have time to fight. Right? Mm -hmm. After the game, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. like you, you throw a bad pass or you get sent off. It's like, okay, right, everyone is mad and they have to move on. Yeah. Right? Okay, we've got less players, let's try and win this game. Later, we can talk about these things. But the problem with work is people are always arguing on the job. It's very rare that, like, I'll give you an example. In, in university, if something was going wrong during term, I know very few people that say, look, okay, we're stuck with this course. It's going to run for the next 10 weeks. Can we talk about this at the end of term? Huh. Like, or we're yeah, doing a yeah, business yeah, pitch yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just do this business pitch. Yeah, it's... And then next pitch, yeah. let's, let's see what we did wrong. People are always like, no, or like, can I just butt in? Or like, and they're completely destroying the game plan. Or, their strategy because the company already has a strategy and for the short term game you throw all of that out the window and that's just, that's basically you're crushing earth so for me mm. the whole point about the, the, the book of earth is that you have to understand the terrain yeah and understand the seasons the weather and whether the that's, context yeah the, the context. context of the situation because that's going to be the deciding factor right the timing and then you have to know how to exist in real time right yeah and once you can do that, then you can only develop better because it's a foundation. Yeah. The mistake 
that a lot of businesses make is that the strategy that got them somewhere, especially now with VUCA, right? Volatile, uncertain, yeah. uh, what was the C? Confusing, probably, I don't know. We'll come up with VUCA, right? Uh, I'll put it, I'll put it right here. <laughs> I forgot. So I got distracted. It's the call to prayer, the sunset. Is it? Yeah. That doesn't sound like it. <laughs> I think a kid grabbed the mic and he's on it because it's about to like it's about to go off. Right. We'll go into it's it. Okay. okay. It's about to go off, but the kid grabbed the but mic and don't I was throw your strategy out of the window. Even if you see these articles saying it's a me it's tremendous change, things that you've never seen Uncertain, before. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just like think oh like we did stores now we're going to go online and we don't do yeah. stores anymore. Yeah. Just think about the terrain and what got you there in the first place because. If you look deeper into the ground, there are probably still tools that you are not using. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's all I want to say. So, I guess, I mean, I think the kid is indicating that it's about to be a call to prayer. It's uh, sunset now. Yeah. Anyway, that was it. I'm going to get the, the, bar, the bartender. <laughs> so he'll grab it. He'll grab the bartender. But I'll just end with the key points, just to sum up while he grabs it, is knowing how and when to adapt, being able to adapt timing having a strategy and the way you develop a strategy is through practice and having experience but we want to introduce it. you <laughs> what's your name bro i'm agus alari <laughs> i'm from rifa grill bar and terras <laughs> i make it special mocktail for my way thanks very much bro <laughs> thank you anyway thanks so now that is the call to prayer that's coming right there so yeah and i was ending with it but yeah, if you want to throw in some points, I just said that you no, need to have that. Anyway, thank you guys. We'll come with vlog number two later on. And now that's about prayer. Okay, dude.